I'm so happy to uh, come together with you again as we together go through uncharted times and uh, new opportunities in ministry. And I trust that we're relying upon what matters most, our love for God, our love for each other, our love for His Word, and to treasure the moments that God places before us. We all need to hear a word from God. And I truly believe that he has a word for us today. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Psalms 119, beginning at verses 49 through 56, as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study in just a moment. Our prayer meetings at Abbots Creek Missionary Baptist Church always have been, and always will be, about following the word, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We normally do a prayer gram and send it around and everyone signs that we pray over the needs that are there. And then we mail those out to folks to say, we love you, we care about you. We didn't just say, let's pray for them, we prayed for you. And we put feet on our prayers and said, you matter to us. And I know for me personally as pastor, even though it's impossible in these days to be able to go to the homebound and to be with them, that uh, you go there often and you see the prayer gram on the refrigerator to say, my Abbots Creek Church family is faithful in praying for me. And we're going to be faithful today as we follow God's Word. Uh, I'm just so grateful uh, that maybe this program is going to be a YouTube program, the first one ever, to go out that God's Word would just minister. But I'm very, very grateful for our student pastor, Josh, uh, and his love for the Lord and his love for our students and our love for he and his family going to come and lead us to the throne of grace and ask God to bless our nation in this moment and this time in uh, this fellowship of worship together. Would you join with me in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord God, we are thankful to you for your faithfulness and for your goodness and for your grace and your mercies that are new every morning. And Father, many praying right now, wherever they're at, in their homes, in their offices, right here, Father, we are unsure of what the future holds. There's a lot of unsettledness, uh, spoken and unspoken. But I praise you, Father God, that you are a sure foundation. You are a rock. You are a strong tower. The righteous run to you and they are safe. And Father, I just pray that you would help us to do that. Lord, I pray for the many in our congregation that are uh, dealing with illnesses, dealing with physical illnesses, spiritual illnesses, emotional. Uh, during this trying time, those things can be heightened. And so I pray right now that you would touch them. And you would encourage them. And I pray, Father God, you would help us as a church family to be very real about reaching out in maybe new ways uh, that our hearts would be pricked and sensitive to those who are experiencing loneliness at, a, at an even higher level now because they can't get out and about and see one another. And so I pray you would touch them. Father God, I pray for our nation and for our leaders and that you would give wisdom, that you would give discernment. <clears throat> Father God, we ask that you would help righteousness and, and integrity to rule in the hearts and minds of our leaders. Father God, that you would surround our leaders with people of principle and people of prayer. And people who, yes, are seeking your face so that they have uh, the wisdom that comes from you. So, God, we just ask that. We, we know that's in obedience to your word as you command us to, first of all, lift up prayers to those that are in authority. And we do that. But, Lord, above all, we just say we are dependent upon you. No matter what our leaders might do or not do, we know we can trust you. You are a good God and you are a loving God. And so I pray, Father God, that in this time of Bible study together and singing praises to you together as we do it together uh, through technology, as we do it together here, Father, that you would be honored and glorified. 
and that you would help us, Lord, just to seek your face and find strength from you. And we'll thank you for that. For it's in the wonderful and amazing name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Good to have you with us today. Uh, the be singing a couple of songs at this time. The solid rock and then take the name of Jesus with you. The words will be up on the screen if you'd like to share with us. Sing together with us. <laughs> Jesus with you, three verses.
Thank you, Pat and Patsy. Months ago, months ago, I felt the Lord leading us to share together in Psalms 119, and we began that and have had uh, great joy in that. I thought about this. Uh, why will we be studying this passage of Scripture on Wednesday nights for such a time as this? I believe God knows now and God knew then what was needed and so if you turn to Psalms 119 beginning there with verse 49 I preached a sermon to introduce that sometime back called the 16 minute sermon and our folks got very excited they thought I was going to do a 16 minute message that day but in fact what I was challenging folks to do was to read what is the longest chapter in the Bible Psalms 119 with 176 verses to read it from as the fellow says kibber to kibber from cover to cover all 176 verses out loud and it would take about 15 to 17 minutes to do that but basically the theme of all of those verses in, encapsulated together is God's Word is enough the theme is the Bible God's Word there are eight titles in the Bible in the first nine verses of Psalms 119. We looked at that. Law, testimony, precepts, statutes, the way, commandments, judgments, and the word. But it's an alphabetic acrostic. What does that mean? Well, the English language has 26 letters in it. A, B, C, D, E, F, G through Z. The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters in it. Psalms 119 has 22 sections. Each section is subtitled for the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph, A-L-E-F, to Tav, T-A-V. But the number 8 in Hebrew means abundance or more than enough. And I want you to get this today. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, whatever your situation, the Bible says God's Word is more than then enough. The number eight means that. The number eight is stamped all over Psalms 119. The number eight is a number of new beginnings. Each section in those 22 pieces have eight verses within it. There are eight special names for God's word listed. There are eight symbols of the word that are given. The believer has eight responsibilities to the word. It is though God himself is saying, God's Word is enough. So let's pick up this Wednesday prayer meeting from Psalms 119, beginning there in verse 49 and going through verse 56. For we see there, we see there something that God teaches us that I believe we need to understand not only as a church, but as a nation today. And that is that we need to be able to see in the darkness. We need to be able to see in the darkness. Barbara Johnson writes about, in a book, this story. The day started out rotten, she said. I overslept. I was late for work. We used to complain about going into work, didn't we? Now we'd like to do that. Everything that happened at the office contributed to my nervous frenzy, she said. By the time I reached the bus stop for my homeward trip, my stomach was one big knot. As usual, the bus was late, and the bus was jammed. We'd like that again, wouldn't we? I had to stand in the aisle as the lurching vehicle pulled me in all directions. My gloom and sadness deepened. Then I heard a deep voice from up front, boom. Beautiful day, isn't it? Because of the crowd, I could not see the man, but I could hear him as he continued to comment on the spring scenery, calling attention as a bus drove down the road to each approaching landmark. This church, that park, this cemetery, that firehouse, soon all the passengers stopped looking at their phone and looking doom and gloom and started gazing out the window together. The man's enthusiasm was so contagious, Barbara says, I found myself smiling for the very first time that day. We reached my stop, maneuvering toward the door, I got a look at our guide, a plump figure with a black beard, wearing dark glasses. He was carrying a thin white cane. 
Beautiful day, isn't it? It's all in our perspective. Hope, like light, shines most brightly in the darkest night. Let me say that again. Hope, like light, shines most brightly in the darkest night. I want to say to you, these are very different days for all of us. They are unsettling because there are unknowns. And we hang on and wait for new news and a new word and a good word. And we realize that there seems to be a new normal that's not normal for us. I just got word that someone in our congregation is in the hospital. And I can't physically go into the hospital anymore. They won't let pastors in or even family members in. And I know earlier this week a person had to go to the hospital because of something that happened. And the family had to actually stop at the, at the ER and, and let the person be given to the folks. And they had to stay outside. These are new days and difficult days and hard days. With the word coronavirus that we didn't even know what that was. Even though we should have. And now we know. Charles Spurgeon, though, says this, and I love this, never question in the dark what God showed you in the light. I believe today there are three rays of sunlight of hope in these few verses in Psalms 119. Let's look at them together. Ray of hope number one is found in verses 49 through 51. And that ray of hope is this, God remembers His people. Let's look at it. The Word of God says, Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. I love that. This is my comfort in my affliction. We need to hear that, church. This is my comfort in my affliction for your word has given me life. Praise God. Verse 51, The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. Hope is present here and now. Hope is present in the future, in the hereafter. Hope looks forward to something. Hope looks upward to someone. And that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you, I want to ask you to think for just a moment. Do we still believe that heaven is real? No one's talking about heaven. Heaven is just as real today as it was several weeks ago. It may be even more real for us to think about the blessings that God has given us and the loved ones gone before us that we long so desperately for, and the fellowship with our Father when there is no more sickness. We've heard that before, but there is no more coronavirus. Praise God. We have comfort in our affliction, the Bible tells us. Thank God for the times that He gives us a word to stand on, a promise we can find hope in. The Bible teaches us in Joshua 1, 9, Be strong of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. That song, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. The Bible teaches us there that comfort leads to courage. Let's look at verse 2. 2 Corinthians 1, 2, 3, and 4. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Look at verse 4. Who comforts us in all our tribulations. That's today. That's a word from God today that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Comfort that leads to courage. Think about from the Word of God. Moses stood before Pharaoh and said, Let my people go. God gave him courage to say that. David killed Goliath with five smooth stones and a slingshot called faith. And God gave him courage to do that. Jesus was headed to the house of Jairus. And something happened because Jairus, the Bible says, he knew that his daughter was at the point of death and he came to Jesus and he pleaded earnestly with him that he would come to his house and help in that situation. And the Bible says that Jairus bowed down and then Jairus believed and Jairus brought Jesus home with him. We need to bow down. We need to believe. 
We need to really believe and we need to bring Jesus back home with us in prayer and in the word, in the meditation and in seeking God and in family devotions and in letting our, our love emulate out and letting the truth of Christ and the love of Christ flow out in phone calls and text and yes, YouTube messages, whatever way possible to show God's love. Jesus said to Jairus, take comfort, Jairus. Your daughter's not dead. She's only sleeping. And then he said these words, Talitha Kumai, Talitha Kumai, damsel, get up. And she was raised. Real love, a father's love, brings real hope. I think what we've seen, and what I'm getting excited here, what we've seen and what we've come to understand is there's a false love and a false hope and a real love and a real hope. There was a love letter to a man. This is an example of false love. This seems real. People that were supposedly in love send love letters. And so this girl sent a love letter. Her name's Marie. His name's Jimmy. And she said, Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I've felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. So please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. And congratulations on winning the lottery, Jimmy. That is what the world kind of says to us that, 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 that shows us is real love. The real love is emulated through God giving His only Son the best that He had to give the person of Jesus Christ. How much did Jesus love us? He said, I love you this much. And He stretched out His arms. And He died for us. And He asked us to accept that love and to embrace that love and to, and, to, and, to, and to find comfort in that love and to find strength in that love and to find courage in that love. God remembers His people. That's the ray of sunshine, number one. Number two, God's people remember His Word. Look further at verse 52 of Psalms 119. The Bible says, I remembered your judgments of, Lord, of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. So the comfort gets deeper. I have comforted myself. Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. Verse 52, I comforted myself. You ever question God? You ever ask God why? God can handle questioning. God's a big God. But I think the question we ask is the wrong question. We ought to say, instead of why, 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 why me, why now, why this, we ought to say who? God, who was there for me? If I didn't know where to turn. God, who was there for me when I knew that I had to I had to stop what I was doing and I had to go a different way. Who was there for me when I didn't know what to say or what to do or what to believe? Who was there for me? God, you were there. You have always been faithful. You have always been true. You have always been God. Verse 53, the psalmist, the psalmist looks backwards in verse 52, but the psalmist looks ahead in verse 53. He says, someday, all of us must stand before God someday. And we stand before a holy God. And when we do that, we better have a holy fear and realize that a holy God who loves us and gave Himself for us will also ask us to stand before Him and give an account. And my deep prayer is that every one of us could say this, listening to my voice today, Lord, I love You and I gave my heart to You and I want to serve You and I ask You to forgive me and I want to live for You and I want to finish faithful. But the truth of the matter is, According to the Word of God, there will be many that will say, Lord, Lord, do not do this and do that. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And so I know that even in these hard days, I believe it's forcing us to understand what matters most. Our love for God, either we have it or we don't, and our love for those people around us. And if we have the love for God, then that love will emulate out and it will work in a mighty way for those we come in contact with. Psalm, the psalmist looks back, verse 52. The psalmist looks ahead in verse 53. The psalmist looks within in verse 54. He uses the word pilgrimage. A pilgrimage away from home. 
a far country. I was thinking, and we were actually discussing earlier about college students. College students who are in their senior year and can't finish on campus and how difficult that must be. And my heart goes out to you as I think about the great joys that you have or folks that had big weddings planned or something on a cruise ship plan or, or opportunities planned and they've had to change now. But our life is a pilgrimage. The Bible says that even in that time, the Word of God will walk with us and guide us and bring good from difficulty and bring glory and bring and grace and, and mercy and comfort. God remembers His people, number one. God's people remember His Word, number two. And finally, God's people remember His name. I love this. The Bible says in verse 55 and 56 of Psalms 119, I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. And this has become mine because I kept your precepts. His name. I remember His name in the night. So I challenge you at night time. Even if there's an empty place in the bed beside you. Even if there's darkness down the hallway from where people used to be. Even if your house it was suddenly silent is filled with chaos. And you just want some peace and some calm. In the nighttime of your heart, in the darkness of the night, the light of Jesus Christ is still real. And so I want to just ask you today to just take God at His Word and understand God's Word is faithful. Psalms 119, the 16-minute sermon. I challenge you to read it. I challenge you to study it. I say to you more than any other chapter in any other place in the Bible, separate from the Gospels that give the good news of Jesus Christ, there is no place, there is no place that does a greater job than giving us the word for what we need for this moment. When Lloyd Douglas, author of The Road and other things, was a student at the university, he lived in a boarding house. And he tells about a story when he lived in the place that he did in a boarding house. Downstairs on the first floor was an elderly man, a retired music teacher, now couldn't walk, unable to leave his apartment, never went out. And we think we have a hard time. Think about how difficult that would be. Douglas said that every morning they had a ritual they would go through together. This student, this music student, would come down the steps from the university, open the old man's door and ask, well, what's the good news? The old man would pick up his tuning fork tap it on the side of his wheelchair and say, that's middle C. It was middle C yesterday. It will be middle C tomorrow. It will be middle C a thousand years from now. The tenor upstairs sings flat. The pen across the hall is out of tune, but my friend, that is middle C. The old man had discovered one thing upon which he could depend, one constant reality in life, one still point in a turning world, for Christians, Jesus Christ is the middle C. Christ who gave Himself for us, who died for us, who lives in our heart, and who gives us hope. Let's pray. Father God, Father God, would you please take this word, your word, this message, your message, this prayer, your prayer, these songs, your songs, and bring honor and glory to your church, this community, and yes, this world, for such a time as this. Thank you for your word. In the strong name of Christ we pray together. Amen. God bless you.